Welcome, everybody. This week's episode, Nitty Gritty. We are here with Kurt Brown. Kurt, thanks for being here, man. Good to be here. Been, uh, I've been waiting for this invite for a long time, so this is good, man. This is, I'm, I'm not, what am I, number 51, you said? I made it. 51. That's right. It's easy to count again, because <laughs> we just said 50, and I remember that one. So Kurt and I have known each other for a long time. I don't even know how long, 10 years-ish? Oh, more than more 10, than that. for sure, yeah, 12, 13, 14 years. So I'm guessing. Kurt is probably one of the smartest people that I know. That's saying something. Yeah. That's how he got me in here. He says stuff like that, man. That's That's how he got me in the... I know how to flatter people. people. like compliments, man. (laughs) Um, But Kurt currently started... I mean, you got all sorts of businesses going, but the main business is Town Square Capital. So Kurt and I know each other from the financial world, and Kurt has been managing money, doing the investing for people for quite a while. When did you get started in the industry? What year? Oh, boy. You know, I, I pushed paper right out of high school in okay. a brokerage house when I was 18 years old. And okay. that's been 32 years ago. Okay. Yeah, 31 years. And then was uh, was a missionary for a couple of years and then came back and then really got, into, got it. This, into it. I've spent my whole career doing this, even in school. Yeah. So Now, yeah. remind me, you grew up in Sacramento, right? Yep, Sacramento area. Okay. Yep. And growing up was finance on the brain did your dad teach you finance did you come from this super well-off family <laughs> you you're asking because you know <laughs> no i my dad was a mechanic an elevator mechanic a uh, whole career uh, nobody from my family's ever graduated from college um including you including me <laughs> yep i was a streak i'm proud to continue um no i i grew up loving sports i mean that was my you know yeah I, basketball was my life um, but really when I, when I ran into finance and wall street, no joke, one of the most embarrassing things I can tell you about myself is that the, the, the show family ties Oh yeah, with Alex P Keaton and probably like half your listeners were not old enough to know that show, but that's what got me interested in wall street. And so I, Was it, it really, yeah, I kid you not uh, just as a kid, as a seventh or eighth grader huh. and, you know, started kind of like poking around what's wall street and this and kind of learning about it. And in the eighties, wall street was cool. You know, it was at that time it was cool to want to be a stockbroker or go to Wall Street or something like that. It it's became like what everybody wanted to do. Yeah, it became not cool, you yeah. know, for a long time. But when I was a kid, I uh, that's what really got me looking into it was the movies and the media and the shows and stuff like that. And I thought this is basically like a poker game, but it's like how you make a living, you know. <laughs> and it, it felt a lot like sports, and so that that's initially what drew me in. Yeah. And of course, my opinion of it is very different now. You know, time goes by, but yeah, that, that was my initial interest. And then, so you hooped growing up. Yep. You're not going to talk about it very much, but you were really good. <laughs> so it was so long ago now. I can't <laughs> talk about it. When I'm was like, the last time you played ball? Have oh, you- it's been many years. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't ball at all. I'm not yeah. one of those guys. that's like, I'm going to go down and hammer the church ball and pretending I'm Jordan. No, <laughs> you know, you got to know when you're done. I'm done. You know. So my favorite story of you playing ball was the summer league. Mm hmm. So this was the pro am league. Yep. Yeah. So that was you had played at that point you were playing JUCO ball, right? Yep. In in California. Yep. This was in the so what happened? early nineties. You grew up in Sacramento, did okay, you know, uh, was okay in high school, was recruited a little bit, but but uh we kind of had some family situations that made it I needed to stay close to home. My mom passed away at a really young age and um so I stayed local. And I would help. And at this time, this is when Kenny Smith played for the Kings. And Kevin Johnson was from Sacramento, and he was in Phoenix, and he'd come home in the summer. And these guys started up a summer pro-am league. And they would take, you know, all the NBA players that lived in Sacramento, and then they'd take all of the the college players that they felt like had decent game, and they'd create a little league. And there was like two NBA players, and there was like maybe six or eight teams. And I was helping Kenny Smith run his basketball camp. I was like one of the coaches every year at the basketball camp. And he was a great mentor. I mean, he was, you know, not, not only a great player, but just an unbelievable guy, you know. And, um, and so my very first time I got invited to play, I mean, how great, how, like, I thought it was a total stud, right? I mean, I get invited <laughs> to play in this pro-am league. And, and I had done well, and I was playing juco ball, and I was doing well at the junior college level. And, and my very first game, very first trip down the floor, long rebound. Kenny gets it on the wing. We've got a switch because I'm near Kenny and I go out to pick him out outside the three point line, you know, like I'm going to check him. (laughs) 
And I kid you not, he broke me down on a crossover so bad <laughs> that literally by the time I could even turn my head to see where he was, he'd already picked up his dribble to lay it into the hole. <laughs> and and I and I, I I was I was fairly quick for a college player, you know, and I literally laughed out loud like super loud in the gym and just started running down to the other end of the floor. And I remember I got home that night. I was living at home still. And I told my dad, he said, Hey man, how'd it go down there tonight? You know? And I just said, well, I'll tell you one thing. I don't have an NBA career in front of me <laughs> this much. I know <laughs> so. you don't think the separation is so big between college and pro, but it is, yeah. it is a big difference. You know, so, on the uh, one of the teams, Otis Thorpe was on one of the teams. Uh -huh. You know, he was in Sacramento at the time. It's six eleven, six ten guy that could run past me oh my God. as a point guard, or at least keep. You know, I it maybe right. neck and neck, but I mean, That's you, thing, you see a guy that athletes. size. Oh yeah, like I remember. Do you remember back in the day? I think it was he played for the Browns. Rogers, the nose tackle. Mm -hmm. He was like six three, like almost four bills, but they said that he could stand flat footed and dunk it. Like that is just Sick. crazy. Yeah. Six three nose tackle. That's he's got to be an athlete. Yeah. That's pretty tall. Yeah, dang. But um, yeah, that's when I knew my career was. I better get serious about the stock market and get a get on with my life. Well, because they would make fun of you because you were you would just pack the Wall Street Journal around. Oh, you yeah. were a nerd. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, JUCO ball, airplane, you know, bus wherever I was, hotel. I'd sit around. They once I developed a love for the stock market. The guys I played ball with just were merciless. I mean, absolutely merciless. Wow. <laughs> like, how did that happen, though? I mean, obviously, it started when you were young, yeah. seventh, eighth yeah. grade. You, you know? know what really got it was fascinating to me about markets as a whole was I, I was trying to figure out the price movements. Why, why could something so stable, like, let's say, Intel, how could their stock move around so much day to day? And their business why? doesn't really change. Their business is not changing hourly. Right. So for me, it was it was the game of it that actually lured me in. I'm in it for a very different. In fact, kind of I hate the game of it now. Yeah. You know, here I am 30 years later. Right now I'm the old guy. <laughs> right. But now, now I don't love the game of it. It's very different to me now. But that's actually what drew me in and was really fascinating. I wanted to I, I basically tried to gamify it. And I spent the next several years studying it. And I was good with numbers. I always did. You know, I I did really well in school and was good in math and stuff. And I, I started getting all of the data that I could about the stock market and it became an obsession. So when I transferred to BYU, I should have been dating. Like I should have had a social life <laughs> and I was a complete nerd. <laughs> like I was holed up in my apartment. One roommate was playing doom, this video game doom all the time. I wanted to punch him in the face. Um, and I was over here like on my computer, just literally all night, just aggregating data. And this was before like high frequency trading and this kind of this early nineties, you know? And so I wrote a really simple, stupid program on an inefficiency in, in, the, in, in the stock market. And, and by the way, it's not complicated, but no one was doing it then yeah. was, the, you know, sort of the difference. And I started paper trading this algorithm for lack of a better word. And it worked really well. So, so then, paper of course, trading means using fake money. Yeah. Yeah. Just pretending like I had a portfolio. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what is paper trading? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it sounds like paper hanging, just, right? Yeah, it just, sounds like just think everybody listening is me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So just remember that. So so at that time, so you'd wrote a program basically that And this what, is what, ninety something? Yeah, early nineties, ninety three, ninety four. That and so when you say inefficiency of the market, basically it was you were finding an opportunity to buy a stock at a good price, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a, a an it's oversimplification. A really but yeah, dumbed that's, down that, way that, no, to that's say. what it was. That's what it was. How much money do you manage now? Well, I'm, I'm trying to tie this into the <laughs> yeah. being a nerd in college. <laughs> yeah, how that <laughs> actually worked out for we you. We oversee a couple bucks. Now. Yeah, see, it's a little there bit more go. than. So don't make fun of nerds, than, idiots. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that was uh, that was the beginning of it for me. And then of course I, in, you know, I didn't need student loan money. I had a scholarship, but I got the student loan money and started trading the student loan money. <laughs> P.S. Not recommended for anybody listening to the podcast. Um, and oh, then a, student loan applications just went up. <laughs> right. Well, I know. I never say now. that. I I never publicly disclose that. And here I am talking about it on your <laughs> podcast. But um, now at that point at BYU, they have these like fake investing competitions, right? Yeah. Where you can kind of you can enter and they give you a fake 
fake hundred thousand, you know, bucks, money, yeah. and then it's called paper trading. Yeah, called paper trading. <laughs> yeah, just for the layman. <laughs> so you started doing that at BYU, right? Yeah, it was one of those things that we've all done in our finance class somewhere along the line, where they say pick five stocks for the semester and let's see. It was never designed to be a trading competition. It was supposed to pick one and hold on to it. Yeah. And I, I made seven or 800 transactions during the semester and really pissed off the people <laughs> at the business school at BYU. They changed it and now they've killed it. I think it's dead. I don't even think they have it anymore. It used to be called the BYU Investment Challenge. I could see students loving that and actually learning it something. It was so Crazy. Fun. It's like real world like experience. We did that in yeah. elementary school. I yeah. remember that. Like uh, It was just, yeah, you, you have $100, pick a stock, and then we would just check in on it every day. Yep. And I mean- why don't we do stuff like that? I, I mean, that should be happening all through school. Totally agree. Well, yeah, like wow. I, I've talked to Cash, so my youngest is ten, and like I'll start, I'll start talking to him about stocks. Okay, like, hey, you have a hundred bucks, dude. Like this is how this works. Like you can go and buy Nike or Under Armour, and you could own some of the company, and then it can go up. He's like, what? And so he'll like, like start screw like screw Under Armour. They support Utah. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll hey, like it, start. It, following by the way, stuff. no joke. The 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 ten to 20 year old kid in this country is some of the best wall. Those are the best wall street analysts. They'll tell you, we don't know. They'll we'll tell you what's you. cool. Is that what you mean? Yep. Right. I got it. totally believe Cameron's that. Got it. Cause totally believe that. So we're, you just pay attention, man. Yeah. You listen to those conversations. That's really interesting. That's where the puck's going. We're right? going to get to that about how no one knows okay. what the crap they're talking about, <laughs> but yet they get paid a lot of money. And yep. For some reason, the whole world follows what they say, but don't, Oh, I can't wait to get Andrew started <laughs> on this one. Oh yeah. Woo! Um, so investing competitions, you started to win them. I won a couple of them. Yeah. So your little algorithm that's yeah. super easy was obviously pretty good. It, yeah, it, it was working. Okay. And, <laughs> well, it's and, not exactly like the nineties. It's not exactly like nobody really knows how to code back then. Right. 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 So, I mean, setting up just a little, let me give you an like idea. That, you're making it the sound super easy. Well, the information you get on Yahoo finance, right? Click, click, click Yahoo finance would cost it, it actually cost me a thousand dollars a month oh my God. to Back subscribe then? to the service at my apartment at BYU. That's what I hate. And, well, and student loans though, you're good. Yeah, student loans. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally covered. I'm still I'm still paying on them? No, I'm not. I, <laughs> I actually did pay them off. But <laughs> that's um but you know three percent uh, interest was nice. But yeah, it was a thousand bucks to get real time Quotes to get real time financial well, we take it for granted. Now, well back but. then that was that was the job of a stockbroker, it was access to the information That's because right. nobody had it. That's right. There was an internet. You couldn't just pull up the information on a stock. You didn't know what anything was happening. So people had to hire them because they needed to get access that's to the right. information. And that's why the business is so different now. Uh-huh. Right. You didn't have access to anything. You read it, you read it the next day in the Wall Street Journal. You read it a week later. What's that? I yep. mean, right. And it's now, all different now. Now there there is no hidden information now. Yeah. Back then that's where it all was. Yeah. It was this behind this paywall. Right, whether it's got Yahoo it. Finance or whether it's a stockbroker well, or an and advisor. let's face it, it was a good old boys club too. There was a lot of insider information. When I went to the floor, and, and maybe we'll get to this in the storytelling, but yeah. when I went to the floor, that was what made us on the floor so valuable. This is why the guys you see on, as floor traders today, not valuable, right? We had front row access to the information. I could tell you some pretty good stories about making money in those days. <laughs> like it was, you know. I miss it. <laughs> oh, I, I miss it. you've got the perfect personality for it. <laughs> like you're, I can only imagine what you were like when you were 20 years old. So, so here's here's truly what happened. So, I I'm running this strategy out of my dorm here, basically in Provo, and I have no money, right? Because I I grew up, we didn't have money, so I thumb it to New York City, and and I was hold on, you thumb it, you yeah. hitch. For those of yeah. you not watching YouTube, yeah. you put a thumb I've in there. This part of the story yeah. before, yeah. yeah. Amazing. So I get to New York, and I had called a bunch of people that were on the BYU alumni list. Now uh, uh, I'm a convert to the LDS Church, and I'm thinking, oh, the, they went to BYU, and I went to BYU. They'll see me, right? I'm thinking somehow this matters. <laughs> so I get I get this alumni call list, and I'm calling all these investment bankers and people in New York, and I'm like, hey, man, my name's Kurt. I'm a junior at BYU, you should see me. <laughs> and no one's either calling me or giving me right. So I decided, well, I'm just going to show up at their door. Oh, so I, I, I thumbed it out. I did this both to San, I did went to San Francisco twice like this in New York once like this. Oh, and what gosh. I would do, 
I can't even believe I'm repeating this. Holy I crap. Uh, This is the most dramatic story. I show up. There's this one guy. I won't name him by name. LDS guy. He's at Goldman Sachs. He's a partner. And he won't call me back. But he's in charge of the hiring of college students. Now, granted, they only hired MBAs. They weren't hiring undergrads that didn't even graduate yet. But I wanted him to talk to me. So he wouldn't. So I showed up at the office one day, 50th floor. And I go, I go to the secretary and I say, hey, I've got an appointment with this guy. I hope I don't name him by name accidentally. And, uh, and he's we expecting can edit me it. it's fine. At, at 10 a.m. And she's, okay, hang on. And she calls back. And then I, and she says, please sit down over here. And I can tell she's on the phone. And there's confusion. Because, of course, I don't have an appointment. And I'm sitting over here in the lobby. And this goes on for a while. And then finally some young punk kid who's working like 100 hours a week comes up to get me. And he says, you know, we don't have you in the, in the, in the calendar. And I said, well, I flew from Salt Lake for the meeting. And the look on their faces was like, what the hell are we going to do? The kid flew in from Salt Lake. So, so of course they get me the meeting, but I had to wait like 45 minutes. So finally they put me back in this office and I'm on the trading floor at Goldman in this glass conference room, watching out on all this. And then another 30 minutes goes by and this guy walks in the guy I'm waiting for. And he's got a huge plate of Chinese food, massive guys the size of a house this particular dude I, I, he needs the food so he walks into the conference room and he looks at me and he's clearly visibly pissed and he puts the chinese food down on this little mini conference table and he goes see this food this is literally this is the whole this is how it starts see this food i'm gonna start eating this food and you're gonna talk and then when 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 i'm done eating then i'm gonna talk and then the meeting's gonna be over <laughs> this is how the interview starts and he starts eating so i start Pitching him, right? Fortunately, it goes really well. We start having a little dialogue, right? He, okay. He gives me, you know, hey, I'm interested. You should get in the program. Okay, whatever. And for a kid like me, who's had no access to white collar anything his whole life, right. I just need a ticket in the game is kind of how I'm feeling, right? And I'm running my trading strategy back here in Provo, you know? And as we're walking out the door, he turns around, pulls a business card out of his suit and starts to hand it to me. And he looks me in the face and he goes, we didn't really have an appointment today, did we? And it was one of those moments of truth in your For early sure. life, right? See, I'd be bragging about it. That and I'm like, thinking, no, we did not. And I, and, and I did. I did. I said, no, no, of course we didn't. And he laughed and bellowed, <laughs> loved it. Oh, like I his favorite part of the story yeah. was that we didn't have an appointment. This is how it went. I broke into conferences. I'd go to the, I'd go to the registration table and say, I lost my packet. I need my packet. And I'd go meet Wall Street analysts. And this was really how I got. And one day I was going to interview for an analyst job, a research job, because I was a numbers guy. And this is to your kind of earlier point. Right. They, the, the woman was running late that was going to interview me. And the, and the assistant said, can you sit out here on the trading floor and wait? And for 20 minutes, I sat there and I watched the traders on the floor. Two phones in their ears, screaming and yelling at each other. I got 2 million IBM that just came in. I got to get rid of them, blah, 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 you know. And by the end of that 20 minutes, I was done. I knew, knew I, I knew what I was going to do. Yeah. I, that, that trip back to Salt Lake was the most sort of confirming. I was done. In fact, I canceled everything else I was working on. And at that point, I was going to become a trader. That's I would have had a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> Watching that. Holy crap. Isn't it so funny how we're all so different? Like the way we're wired. Yeah. Like that just, just hearing you talk about it now. I mean, this is over, what, 30 years ago, you yeah. said? Like you love it. I love like, it. Just, just the energy from the story i can only imagine and i'm just sitting here going oh my gosh i think that's what hell is <laughs> like hell is probably different for everybody right or else I it agree wouldn't with really that. work yeah like i think like it's like the matrix that's great right anyway <laughs> what a story so after you got back from then yeah is that when you got seated yeah your fund yeah yeah. So, so that's kind of a crazy story. Yeah. My mission president had heard I was working on something and we were pretty tight. You know, I worked with him pretty close in the mission field for several months. And then we stayed, you know, he was like a second dad. Yeah. And he founder of a big publicly traded company, very wealthy, heard that I was working on something. And he came down and took me to lunch at the brick oven south of <laughs> BYU's campus. This is where my life changed. Was the, you know, most, anyway, that's a tangent. Never mind. I'm going to make a joke about back seats of cars, but my life changed <laughs> at a brick oven. <laughs> with my mission president. And uh, I wonder how many lives changed in the brick oven. <laughs> you know, probably quite a few. It's in been this there town? For a yeah, long for sure. Time. Oh, yeah. Wow. So he says, well, Tell me about what you're doing. So I lay it, lay it on him, you know. 
And at this point, I'm going to go to New York because now I've networked. Yeah. I've lied my way into enough meetings that I'm, I've got a network in yeah. New York. And he says, you don't want to go to New York. So we start talking and he says, tell me about your strategy. So I tell him about this trading strategy. I kid you not. He gets his checkbook out, opens it up and starts writing in his checkbook. And he writes me a personal check for a hundred thousand dollars. Right there on the spot. Right there. Kurt Brown, 100,000. Here you go. Hands it to me. My budget was $330 a month. I was driving a Honda Accord that had about 270,000 miles on it at the time. And he says, uh, it's time to see what you can do with real money now. No, no more. He didn't even know about the student loan money. He said, no, <laughs> he said, he said, no more fake money is what it was, this quote. And that was it. That's what started it. And I lost 40,000 of the 100,000 in a couple of weeks. And I thought, I, was, I, bec- I thought I was dead. I thought I was dead. I stopped going to class. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't, I didn't sleep. I'm not sure I showered. I don't remember. I mean, it's like, it's like PTSD around that window of time in my life now, you know? And the truth was, is that the emotion, and this is the takeaway, I think for a lot of clients and investors, because I deal with so many investors on a weekly basis, you know, emotion hijacks the best of plans, you know, and it did. I mean, I, I, I was executing very differently than I had for the years prior to that, because the pressure of a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, I didn't know if I'd ever see that kind of money in my life, oh, you yeah. know, and then it's your mission president's money, you know, it just blew up my brain. So the best part of the story is I go up to see him right after and I'm, I'm on the edge of tears, literally at his house in holiday. And, and he listens to me and I'm like literally going to have like a nervous breakdown. I mean, $40,000. It's I'm living on 300 bucks a month. Yeah. The student loan money I was trading was like three to $5,000 loans. I mean, this is like, you know, so he finally kind of starts laughing <laughs> and he says, I'm worth a lot of money. A hundred thousand dollars is like 20 bucks right. to you. He goes, let me do this. He said, the problem here is the pressure. So we're going to take the pressure off. That money's already gone from my mind. And in fact, anything you make, we're going to give away. We're going to donate it. I'm never going to see it again. And it worked. Wow. I went home. And then over the next several years, do you know how much money we donated covertly? One morning he called me. By this point, we'd made a lot of money together, him and I. This is a couple of years later. And he says to me, he calls me one morning early on his way to his office. And he says, um, do you see that thing on the news last night about the guy that needs a heart transplant? I said, no. He says, the guy's got four kids, no insurance, could to cost him $95,000 to get this heart. They set up a fund at Zion's Bank to get donations for this guy. He says, we're going to pay for it. Your job is to do it so that nobody knows ever who did it. That's so cool. And that's what I did. And so I, there was a part of every month for those years that, that I just covertly gave money away. We, we had funded businesses, paid off people's loans. We had, it was so much fun. And so I learned real early, if you can get the pressure off and make it arm's distance, right? You make much better decisions. You implement strategy much better if you can get the emotion out of it, you know? So. It's so funny talking investing, but that's how it is in business. You know, all these entrepreneurs that come on and talk about their business, like, you know, like if it's too emotional for you, if, like you, Seth last if, week, if you keep it too baseball. close, yeah. You know, you got to be able to disconnect a little bit. Yeah. And think about the great three-point shooters of all time, right? They'll miss 20 in a row and they look unfazed. Mm-hmm. Right, we're watching Vinny Johnson, right? B- Bad Boys Pistons, yeah. he's kind of running right now. You remember they'd check him in the game; he'd start shooting. If he was cold, they'd just pull him back out and put him on the bench. If he was hot, he'd stay in the rest of the game, right? <laughs> and he didn't care; it was completely unfazed. Mm-hmm. You, you sort of have to have right. that mentality for sure. Yeah. So, this was kind of the beginning of your trading career with your mission president. Yep. So you started with a hundred grand, and you grew it to what? Well. That hundred grand combined with other, other money, money got that added came in, it, yeah. yeah, we that, that grew. I think at the peak, seventeen or eighteen million. <laughs> um, and he had some buddies that put some money in and some things like that. It was fun. And then at that point, that's when did you start reaching out to the big banks, or did they now start paying attention to you? Well, it was just it actually was more fluky than that. There was a a, a big investment bank based in San Francisco called Montgomery Securities. 
there was actually three big investment banks during the tech boom of the 90s, and they were doing all the underwriting of all the dot coms, right? Uh, they were dominating Wall Street for a while, these three big banks. They were eventually bought by B of A, Goldman, you know, whatever. Well, the founder of one of those banks left and purged about 40% of the staff. And so Montgomery itself was really struggling and in, in real serious need of people. And I had been doing, they were my largest counterparty for my trades. I traded with their traders more than anybody else. So they, they, we were on the phone one day and they said, we got destroyed. They, they just purged us of employees. And, uh, and just jokingly, the guy I was on the phone with, who was the head of trading for Montgomery, I said, well, why don't I come out and trade? I'll try. I'll come trade with you. He said, when can you be here? You know, and I said, here's the problem is I run this other money, but we worked a deal. And then we kind of essentially sort of bought my fund, which I ended up taking back later. But I went for a couple of years and then traded on the floor for those guys. Um, and it was unbelievable. And I'd always wanted that experience of like a true Wall Street. So you were in New York on the floor, San Francisco and New York. Yeah, yeah. both. Yeah. What and was I was that? a single guy. I just, you know, was a workaholic. Get up at 3.30 in the morning. It was, you know. Are the stories real from the movies? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, I was oh, yeah. Say, yeah there's... Like that series Black Monday right now on Showtime. It just looks insane. Yeah. I, and I get asked that a lot, like Wolf of Wall Street. Right. And most of those really extreme shows, like Wolf of Wall Street, are pretty, that's not super common. It was happening. But the general concept of, you know, living fast lives, a lot of drugs, a lot of, water. oh, absolutely. That was, it, it, it takes, you have to be wired kind of unique even to be down on the floor in those environments as a trader anyways. And it's not today what it used to be. You know, they controlled the money and had to make decisions in 10 seconds. I mean, right. So it, and it wasn't about smarts. It's about gamesmanship. It, it's, it's a different game. It's different than investing. Trading is very different than investing, but it used to be really critical to the Wall Street banks, and I I loved it. I mean, a lot of the lifestyle things, of course, I found stressful. Um, didn't really totally fit me. I kind of had a hard time actually socially fitting into that environment. You know, they they'd want to go out at night and right. you know whatever. And I could tell you some funny stories about that, but <laughs> um, but and, so I didn't totally fit in socially. Stories, but I loved the work. What was the craziest thing you saw happen? Like, what's the craziest story? Well, I think the funniest story is probably one day after about six months, my boss calls me in, head of trading at Montgomery. And by this point, we're being bought by Nations Bank. And then a year later, B of A bought us. And um, and he sits down with me and it's like in a, in a review, like an employee review. And he's like, you're doing a great job, man. Clients love you. you make a lot of money for the bank. This is great. Okay. I'm like, great. Thinking this is great. And he says, there is one thing. It's like, you know, sometimes, and by the way, when you have clients at that level, they're huge. They're fund complexes. I had one client that paid that I would talk to daily, many times a day, that paid us twenty one million that year in commissions. One client in commissions. Okay, so the amount of money that was flowing through this just made it just disconnected it from reality. And he says to me, you know, when these guys come to town, they kind of want to blow off some st some steam. They don't have a good time. Go out and party, <laughs> and. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, for the first time in my life, you, I, I just told you where I came from, 330 bucks a month, right? And my little fund, right? And Utah to this. And I'm going out and I'm taking people out and we're spending two grand on wine on my, com my car corporate card. That already was racy and edgy for me <laughs> as a stupid kid, right? I mean, I've been looking for batting cages. I can't find it. <laughs> Exactly. And so I said, I'm thinking, yeah, 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 we go out. And I already thought I was spending egregious amounts of money in my expense budget. You know, I'm embarrassed to turn in these receipts. You know, turns out I'm the lowest on the list <laughs> in the whole firm. And um, he says, uh, yeah, yeah, that's good. I know you go out, you have a good time. Yeah. You buy some drinks. And yeah. he says, uh, you know, sometimes they want to get a little crazier, though. And I'm thinking, what's he talking about? You know, and and I and we'd have traders that would want to go to the strip clubs. So I'm thinking, oh, I must be talking about the strip clubs. I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah, well, I'll take the guys over to the strip clubs and stuff like that. You know, and um, and I told him he knew I was I was religious. You know, so I was like, you know, I I don't go to the strip clubs, but I take them anywhere they want to go, and <laughs> and I, I and I and, and I cover it for them. You know, I pay for it and stuff like that. And I kind of thought maybe that's what he was bugged about. He said, no, that's good, that's good. No, I that that's good. 
Uh, and I'm, we're obviously not getting to the issue. You know? <laughs> and, and I'm he's like, th- you're just not getting. And this. I'm thinking he's disappointed because I'm not going into the strip clubs. He didn't even care. And he and he's like, yeah, yeah. And he sits there for a second. And he goes, uh, companionship. Some of these guys like companionship <laughs> when they're in town. And I said, Scotty, hold on for a sec. Are we talking about hookers? <laughs> I say to him, and now I'm kind of laughing. He goes, whoa, whoa, I didn't say it. You said it. <laughs> and it turns out, no joke, like we had accounts at restaurants all around the city where like there were escort services that would contract with the restaurants. And I'm like, Scotty, you are killing me here, dude. I'm a 23-year-old Mormon kid that just moved here from Provo, and I'm supposed to be getting escorts for clients? Like, He's like, hey, man, I'm just throwing it out. Like, No, you just ordered the lobster. That's, <laughs> that's there's it. a code word, right? Right. Yeah. Holy What's crap. the special of the day? It's like, that's why it says market price. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. Anyway, so yeah, the stories are kind of true. I mean, that's an awesome story. I've never seen that in a movie or anything where it's just like you just go into the restaurant and you just know the secret yeah. menu item, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And that's then it insane. comes across on my visa, my Bank of America visa as the restaurant. Holy. And so it was crazy. I remember early on, first week there, going to the bathroom on the trading floor and some guy doing blow in the stall, you know? And um, I was like, man, we're not in Provo anymore. This is a different world. Wow. And you weren't allowed to leave. You know, you're on the trading floor. You don't just leave. Right. So there's there's central PA systems everywhere. So one day it's in there, in the head. You you got to hurry. You got to get back to the desk because you're trading for some huge fund somewhere. You know, and they page some guy over the thing, and he comes stumbling out of the stall. His <laughs> face is covered. He's like <laughs> half pants or half down. <laughs> like what Unreal. is going on? Real. Yeah. Now I will say this: it's changed a lot. Oh, I'm. You sure. know the financial crisis probably more than anything throwing a light on wall street and banks right. has radically changed that business that it, it's still there but it is such a mind it is so tiny now it's um, not the norm anymore absolutely not and it was ridiculous you just had a bunch of young people like us paid way too much money too cocky too uh too disconnected from the real world you know what size of checks are guys getting back then I mean, oh yeah. I mean, if you were just a rookie guy, just the bottom of the totem pole, you were making three or four hundred thousand a year. I mean, and this was this in the nineties, yeah. And that you were the bottom of the list. I mean, crazy. Yeah. What were the top dudes bringing in? Oh, millions per year. It's crazy. I'll tell you, one of my favorite guys. I won't say his name because just in case it got around to him. But there was a guy that was more of a senior guy trading on the floor. Now I look back. I'm almost 50, right? But he was probably 45. He seemed old to me at the time, you know? And he was one of the top traders down there on the floor. And this will tell you about how the traders are wired. That that they're not um they're not playing with a full deck because you you trade <laughs> you trade all week and you work that kind of hours under that kind of pressure. It's a pressure cooker. I mean, you have people screaming at you pissed off at you all the time. And he and then they get on an airplane on Friday afternoon and go to Atlantic City or Vegas. And then fly. I mean, this is literally how the business is wired. So this guy used to every weekend, he'd take off. Well, he's a high roller. So he'd book a private jet and we, you know, and so finally I'm there for a while and he starts inviting me on the Friday afternoon junket. And I'm thinking, junket, <laughs> what am I going to do? I can't even go. Like I'm already having such a hard time figuring out how to like not like not look like yeah exactly <laughs> right, right. I, you don't want to be the dorky kid and you're like you know but you also don't want to like compromise the I human just you are out hookers and blow <laughs> now I gotta learn blow ja- or blow jack but- <laughs> but- <laughs> yeah blow <laughs> You can't edit that. You can't. No, that's great. That's classic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new game. New game. Sorry. But yeah, so you 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 would go down. So he starts taking these Friday afternoon trips. And I, I'm not going to go. What am I going to do with these guys all weekend? I don't drink. I don't, you know. But he starts coming back on Monday morning with checks that are getting bigger and bigger. Anyways, he could count. Okay. He's a numbers guy. And this guy's one of the most brilliant guys I ever traded with. Just naturally gifted. Um, and, uh, and he would never admit that he could count. You're talking card count. Oh yeah. So card. Yeah. He count card. Blackjack. Yeah. Blackjack. Now, you're, speak, now you're speaking your language. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I can't count, <laughs> but I love blackjack. 
<laughs> so he, uh, so he starts coming back and every weekend these store, I'd talk to the guys that would go for the weekend on Monday morning at 4am when we show up on the floor and they'd stay up all night on Sunday night, get back, come right to work. One weekend he comes back and he's they're passing around the check amongst like 10 or 12 of us. So we sat in a pod together on the trading floor and it's a $1.2 million cash out from Rio. Oh my God. And Rio was already really courting him in Vegas, you know, putting him up in whale suites every weekend. Anyway, so we're passing the check around. But then this guy rolls in. For, uh, he was in the bathroom or somewhere. He comes back and we're kind of joking about his check. And he, but they, they walked him. They walked him. That was the last check he took out. And he never, wow. ad, he never admitted that he could count, but they asked him never to come back. And, and he had just been walking it up. You know, he was, he was taking a hundred to 500,000 for months out of the casino. And then, but that's how these guys are wired. This is the, that's the trade you and guys will ask me time. I teach a class over here at BYU in the finance department as an adjunct one finance class, you know, and students that are interested in that will ask me and I'll say, it's not about smarts. It's not about analysis. If you're a great poker player, you're a great athlete. This is who they're looking for, right? A lot of former NFL players are, mm -hmm. are great traders and people like that, you know. And I remember one time the managing director's son at the bank came down and he came out of Harvard, graduated with honors. Daddy let him work wherever he wanted to work. You know, he picked trading. He was gone four weeks later. Right. And I saw his dad in the hall one day. I said, hey, what, what, where'd he go? You know, and he said, just it blew his brain up. You know, he, he wants everything modeled in advance of making a decision. How do you trade on the floor? You got to make split second right. decisions. Oh yeah, I mean, you, and it's all judgment call. There, it's, a, it, it's not. There's no analysis done. It is a judgment call. Well, there's a lot of analysis, but with in, but with partial information. Yeah, yeah, right. And that's what you're you're gaming is is probabilities Which of is poker, data. Right? right. I mean, it's just that's right. Odds. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Well, and then staying cool while it's right. all happening. And by the way, I'll emphasize again, that's very different than investing. And a lot of people see these movies on TV and they think that's what investing is. Investing is completely different. In fact, they're not even the same. Trading is entirely about short-term dislocations, right? Investing is a completely different set of analysis. That's, it's, in, it's buying something that, that has value at the current price that will pay you later. Right. Like if I invest in a barbecue company, right? Right. right. Don't do it. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, really why, different animal. Why do you think that the two get so confused by the average person? Like why does why does everyone think that trading is investing? Because what do I know about being a dentist, for example? I, I can go I, I walk by a dentist and an orthodontist and think they're the same guy. And they're like, No, no, no. We're totally different guys, right? So if you don't know, if this is not your life, some of the smartest guys I know that I've ever met, they look at Wall Street and they're like, I don't really get that. And that's cool because I've been doing this for 30 years all day, every day, all the time. So uh, I have a lot of a sympathy for people who say, I don't really understand how that whole thing works, you know. Which is basically everyone who doesn't work in it. And I'd even say most advisors don't understand it. Oh, many. Hey, the investment product themselves, people get themselves tr in trouble a lot because they don't understand what they're investing in. It's much more important that you're investing in stuff you understand than it is you're getting the, quote, best investment. There are no best investments. There's none. Because you can look back and say Facebook was one of the best investments. Maybe not. Because the profile of your risk may be completely misaligned to that. Do you know how many companies you have to invest in to get a Facebook? Right? So, so the alignment... And the understanding of what you're trying to accomplish is everything when it comes to investing. This is why I can't stand people that prey on the fears of people to get them to do something with investing. It's, it's very dangerous. It's very disingenuous. Which is the media. Oh, and many financial yeah, advisors. Like fear is everything now. <laughs> yeah. It's like nobody's creative anymore. They just use fear. It, yeah. it is. Well, 100%. I mean, your wife, I mean, she worked for, was it KSL? She was at Channel 2 for 10 years. Channel She's two. been at KSL for 10 years, yeah. But talk about a little bit about that. I mean, yeah. I remember we would talk about, like, they would run their, their news meetings and they'd talk about what stories they were going to run. Yeah. Yeah, the morning meeting that they have in the, all these newsrooms, and it was so fun dating her because it was very eye-opening how this game is played. Even local news, right, is that they'll all sit around. Everybody brings their ideas to the morning production meeting, right? And they decide what's going to go on the evening news that night, the channel, whatever it is. And the point is to be sure it will be viewed. 
The point isn't what is the most important news. If we were just doing news, we would have the whiteboard and we would list the most important things to our community. How on earth is that guy's house that caught on fire in West Valley important to anybody other than him and his two neighbors? <laughs> right. Nobody. But the, but the data is if it burns, if you have video of something on fire, people will stop and watch it. So if they get certain video, this is why they send video people all over the place. They're running that thing, right? And fire is one of them. Cute cats that's is that another Netflix, one, right? That, <laughs> that Netflix documentary, I forget what it's called. It just follows two of those private, mm -hmm. they're just independent contractors. And they're just, they I mean, sell it for a ton. they're grabbing a couple shots and then they're blasting out a thumbnail to yep. a bunch of networks and they're just selling stuff that fast. Yep. And it's just crazy. I mean, wouldn't they run the same story under like different headlines too? Mm -hmm. Like positive, yeah. negative. Yeah. The largest online ad company, Outbrain, I'm sorry, Adbrain, they ran a, a, this awesome test. They ran, I think it's, um, 15,000 news stories over a six month period. And what they do is halfway through the day, they change the headline. And they would run one headline for half the day with positive superlatives. And then they'd run uh, the headline with negative superlatives. And the exact same news story, no change of words, would get 70% more click-through with a negative headline than a positive headline. Well, it's like today, Gephardt. Uh -huh. Oh, what you should know about COVID-19 and cash. <laughs> right. And you open it and they're like, well, we don't really know anything. <laughs> but, you know, it can live on cardboard, so be careful. <laughs> yeah, right. That's literally, right. it pisses me off so <laughs> much. But that's totally what they're doing. Well, financial journalism is the same thing. You know, if, 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 you, if you base your investments of your life on what you're hearing in the media, you are going to be a disaster case. I mean, you can't. It's, you're being lied to constantly. I mean, the sensationalism in all directions right. is just mind blowing. You know, ADD is really good for investing because I just forget, <laughs> which is what you're supposed to do. Just, just leave it alone. Don't think about it. They're like, dude, how's your uh, investments? I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. They probably suck right now, but they'll come back later, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, it's got. I know so many people that just like they try to do the whole day trading thing, and I mean, it just consumes them. Well, the worst part is when Suckers they, is when oh, they get totally. something right early because then they think they're good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like they guess That's right like early. That's like I win and blowjack every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In the first 30 minutes, I win every time. And I should just walk away, but I'm like, oh, psh, I'm on fire. I got this. Blowjack. Nope. We coined a new term here today in this studio. I love it. <laughs> I'm using that all the time. Now, though, just so you <laughs> I can't know. Believe I said that. Uh, anyway, but yeah. So if that's how the world works, and we know it is, yeah. and when you get it, I mean, it's almost sad when you get to see behind the curtains on how things are really working mm -hmm. with news and with financial, the big, you know, institutions. What does the average person do? I mean, how do they survive this world without? the knowledge, the experience of where to go, what to listen to, what not to listen to. I mean, how is it possible for the average person to be okay? There's two, there's two parts of that. One is, is the average person is more empowered in this process than they think they are, okay? Because the vast majority of the most important input is your ability to discipline your financial life. If you can spend more, less than you make, right? You can discipline yourself to invest and put money away, stay out of debt. You know, the, some of these really basic financial principles, no one needs to tell you that. You, that is the most important part of the equation. Okay. The second part. Hold on. I yeah. want to touch on that. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand how important that part is. But if you look at these all successful people with tons of money, typically, it's the amount of money they invested, not what they invested in, yeah. that made the difference. Oh, absolutely. And so the people, consistency and the and, and over time is I mean, by far the most important. Input. You could buy the most boring yep. stuff ever. In fact, but I if give you the math. All the time, you're going to be better than that guy who hit Facebook yeah. or hit Amazon. Let me let me give you something that really. Let me sell against myself for a second. <laughs> okay, seventy percent of all financial returns are being invested in anything. 
you can be the worst selector of investments and you're going to get 70% of the return. It's the idiots like me that are going to war on the other 30. That, that literally is, that's, that's, that's white paper material right there. So yeah. that, so that's, 70% I mean, really is just luck. Yeah. Well, so no, no, your ability to discipline and put, get stuff invested and put it away, then you could pick the worst stocks and funds and oh, still you'll have 70% so of what 70, everybody else would so guys like me. It's just getting the money put in. <laughs> right. Yeah. My stash app. Yep. It's just yeah. getting put in those index funds and a few stocks that yes. I like. Yes. Just going in there every week and I'm just like, oh yeah, I don't know. I haven't really looked at it. I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. Interesting. And, and, and that really, to your point, th- that's the most important part of the equation. Now, the flip side is, is that you're also being lied to that there aren't better ways to invest. For sure. It's it, it, But most of our industry is peddling something in the middle. And Andrew, you and I have talked about this a lot over the years. You know, That's why you either keep it super simple, put do it yourself, don't pay anybody to do it, just put an index fund, buy a bunch of blue chip companies, and that's your strategy. Right. Okay. Or go all the way to the other side and do it more optimally. And there are many more optimal ways to do it. We have money managers that I've known for 15 years that have 30-year track records that have beaten the market almost every single year. So I why mean, so why is it that the news always talks about Warren Buffett? Yeah. That's all you hear is yep. you should never do that. Why is that? Okay, there's a couple things. That. One is access. You know, really good funds like this can be hard to access. They get closed. So like, you know, we have a bullpen of 55 money managers we use for our clients and five of them are closed. We still have access because it's a little bit of a big boys club, unfortunately, you know. It still and is. It is. Yeah. So part of it's access. But part of it also. But on that note, access yeah. doesn't necessarily mean secret investments. Oh, no, no, no. Like these guys are still buying Apple and Facebook oh, and Google, right? Visa, like, yeah. But a lot exactly. of times people think that they're investing in these like hidden investments. That's right. That's not true. That's right. It's the structure. It's how they're buying stuff that makes it different. That's right. right. Not what they're buying. And, and a lot of funds, they, they, the, the guys that have been the best at this for multiple decades, they don't need any more money. They all make a ton of money. In fact, what starts to become a problem is if they get too much money, they don't know where to put it and it waters down their returns and then they lose their business. So they're trying to run out of the Rio. I mean, (laughs) geez, poor guys. (laughs) But does that make sense? Yeah, they they, they need a, a certain amount of money. They could keep raising money, but they don't because well, that's we, when you go out and help the the little guy. That's <laughs> that's when you start doing the pro bono stuff, right? And do what you you know what happened for you. Yeah, just find those talented. I think it's so cool that you're an adjunct professor. Oh, I love it. Like that's all college should be. Yeah, that is it. Like what a waste of money and time. Ninety percent of it over there is just a waste. I would never be a tenure track professor. Because oh. hey, how everything... awesome is it that he didn't graduate college, but he's teaching college? Oh, it is the greatest <laughs> fu in the world. It's a little bit of an accident when they invited me to teach. Oh. Andrew knows this. They thought I had a degree. They just assumed, and then I think they were embarrassed to rescind the offer. Oh, for sure. And what's funny is they asked me not to maybe talk about it because that's against their it's so stupid but the like, first day of oh. class what do you think is the first thing i say every <laughs> semester <laughs> so crazy like oh i went to college just to get student loans for my my little uh, investment <laughs> right i remember the first i mean i haven't done anything close to that but i've had two you know when the mba program when they do their finals they usually will do like a big i don't know what you call it some portfolio or whatever on local companies and i've been in there twice and to have these kids up there talking about me and i'm just like you know i I talked my high school algebra teacher into giving me a d so i could graduate high school (laughs) on the friday of graduation and i'm like and umbas are doing a report on me (laughs) suck it (laughs) but i mean it's Uh, i hear you it's crazy the funny thing is is that the biggest emphasis in my class i do a whole lecture on grit oh yeah and how grit trumps everything for sure and this is like my your biggest breaks are grit they're just, i mean absolutely the hitchhiking oh, yeah uh, the fake meat i mean <laughs> that's a movie <laughs> do you own the rights to that yeah. <laughs> i mean i'm thinking of like pursuit of happiness right i mean he just hustled and hustled and hustled i mean tell me that's not a movie watching some mormon kid hitchhike and then we got the blowjack story <laughs> and then we have the like making yourself a meeting like the brick oven i mean that is a freaking book or movie 
There'd be like four people that would watch it, but yeah. It's, no, <laughs> I don't. I disagree. I think that would be. Oh man, you, you got to write a book. I guarantee you, write a book. You'll see that you could make it a movie in a heartbeat. But and I mean, we're not even. T- I know you have much crazier stories than you've told. I, I can't wait for the next episode when you come back. Holy crap! So let's just spend when a little I'm released bit. from my calling. We'll have another. Yeah, what is your calling? The bishop right now. You're a bishop. <laughs> See, the church is true. <laughs> I love it. See, this is what Bishop should be. Real people, real experience. Like whole I can't wait to tell your mission mid president. Sing, mid singles ward. Really? Thirty one to forty five years How singles. Cool. Yeah, we have so much fun. It's so funny. I don't want to be anything but a mission president. Which I know that's not how that want, works. I, I'm with you. But I'm that you. to me that is the most revered like my mission president saved my life. And it is such a cool such a cool calling. Yeah. But I wouldn't want to be any of the other stuff leading up to it. I don't want to be an elder scorn president. Bishop. Oh, my gosh. Maybe a singles ward because you can actually help some people. But, man, I can only imagine the stories these, you know, well, and, and, are getting. Oh, yeah. 31 oh. to 45-year-old singles is a fun group. I, I was that guy. I got married in, in my late 30s. Right. And so. Well, you were in the nerdery. It took okay. me a while. It took me a while. And bless my wife's soul, man, for putting up with me for so long. <laughs> oh, uh, man. Uh, what, a, what an awesome guest. I don't want him to leave. What else can we talk about? There's so much more. Man. See, I'm really interested in the stuff. I think it's so important. I mean, especially with everything that's going on right now, people are kind of freaking out, mm-hmm. right? How do you see that? I mean, one, you're married to yep. a producer of news. I mean, you've been in the epicenter of, I mean, really what makes the whole entire economical world go around. So when you see things like COVID-19, mm-hmm. what do you think? You're not freaking out like everybody no. else. You know why? I, I have this chart that I keep. I, 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 it's on my wall. I started building it 20 years ago. Uh-huh. At, remember Y2K? Oh, if, remember when we mission. thought the airplanes were going to fly out I was of on the, my mission. Yeah. They shut us down for the day and we barbecued in yeah. Chile. It was the greatest day ever. I saw a chart. And I decided to just keep it going. And the chart was a hundred years of stock at, stock market history, with every th- every year the worst thing that happened that year. Hmm. And you should see the list, man. It's World War One, World War Two, Bay of Pigs, JFK assassination. Like it's just one thing after Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. And so every year I've kept it. That I've kept my own version now going for the next twenty years. And this year is coronavirus, right? What's interesting is that the capital markets. Stock market's done about 11% return for those hundred and some odd years. Right. So the truth is, is that the details of what we face as a country, they're always different. Right. But the human response is shockingly consistent. Really? Shockingly. Because the first thing we do is we move, when we see something unknown, you move to a defensive posture. Right. You could be in the woods. You think you see a bear, you go defensive, right? Sure. Okay, so anything you do... so. Investments are the same way. So people will come in and the first blush is panic and fear, right? But then as we sort through it, you eventually, and sometimes it only takes 90 days, sometimes it takes five years, right? Right. But you eventually get back to a point where what matters again is just the fundamentals of life. Hmm. And remember after 9-11, how everybody came on TV and said, our society will never be the same again. Oh. Do you remember that? Every time that's what they said. You remember the fear mongering For around? Sure. Like, okay, the only thing is that is that the TSA is a pain in the ass. That's the oh. only thing that has changed <laughs> since 9-11, right? So, so this will be the same. And it's not that these things are not important. It's sure. That's not meant to be insensitive. The, the human element is different. I'm paid to talk about investing, right? So as you work through this, you look through down the road and you say, will businesses thrive again? And you know why they always will, especially in America, is because we get up, you and me every morning, you run a business. Right. And I don't care what is going on. I, if you and I never see each other again, Cameron, if you run this establishment, I can, I, I'm, I am 100% certain that whatever you're doing, you're going to be trying to maximize the efficiency, the profit, and the product. So I don't care what happens when you come out of that and we all keep competing. We all keep trying to get more. Well, that's what makes the economy grow. That's what, you know. Right. I'll be more profitable than I ever have been once things come out stronger. That's right. Because that's the thing. Like this did force me out of my big comfy bed. Yeah. And like. Okay, where do 
I got creative. Where can I go out and get more sales? Where you know I got to lean up labor. And how many crappy restaurants are out there? By the way, P.S. A ton. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're they're you know, and I don't say this to be insensitive, right. but from an economist standpoint, this is my whole life. You need these cycles to get rid of the weak. There are airlines that should have never been flying. Totally There are true. hotels that should not be open. It's there like are, investors. You know, they get scared. They pull their money out. They shouldn't have been invested to right. begin with. It's, it's a natural thing. And to, part of it is a fool in his money. I mean, and, and the banks aren't exempt from this. There's going to be a lot of energy companies that are based out in North and South Dakota. They're going to go bye-bye because they can't operate at $20 barrel oil. Um, well, restaurants are no different. I mean, you've got multi-million dollar you know, fine dining places that will never be back to find out that they're, yeah. I mean, they don't have escorts anymore, probably. <laughs> I mean, that was probably a nice little cash cow, but you I mean, know, you know what? Cameron will only remember that about me hey, <laughs> five years from now when I run into Cameron. That's the there. escort guy. That's the Bishop. That's Bishop hookers and blow right there. <laughs> that's Bishop Blowjack yeah. right there. <laughs> that, that is the title Can of this episode. Please, <laughs> please call your book Blowjack. Oh that, my gosh. That's going to be the title of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, Blowjack, our new favorite game. No, it's uh, it, it, it. You're right. It's funny. I had two weeks ago. I won't say what area it was, but I was worried about one of the delivery areas because there's another barbecue joint there, mm-hmm. and I and I like them. Like, I mean, I like it. There's room for everybody, but it was funny. I'm like, I don't really want to go into that area because you know he's struggling too. And then the next day, I woke up and I'm like, you know what? I'm working my ass off trying to figure out how to get out and get more sales. And homeboy can do the same exact thing. Yep. And he's not. So you know what? I'm doing it. Yep. It's okay. And, it, and so it wasn't me being insensitive, but it's to your point. There are so many restaurants, and I shouldn't just say restaurants, Business. across all businesses yeah. that are complaining and whining about how things are difficult instead of doing what you said and just, okay, how can I make this? Hitchhiking to New York. Right. How can I make <laughs> this work? You know, and, and, and then listening to other people, the idea for the deliveries I got from a very, very successful friend of mine. He's the CEO of Prime Leasing in Draper, you know, billion dollar company. And he, he just called to say like, Hey, how are you doing? Like, here's some things that I think you should do just to kind of get ahead of all this. And he goes, have you ever done like offsite, like deliveries, like mm-hmm. pre-orders and stuff? I'm like, that's actually a really good idea. And the first week we took phone calls and it was mayhem. So I called a guy I know that's decent with the internet, and I said, will you build me an e-commerce site because I can't take Hmm. 80 phone calls. And it's just kind of, you know, we took 40 minutes to deliver the food the first week. Now we do it in 20. Anyways, it's just been so interesting. So that's the difference. And I'm sure it's the same with all companies. Grit, baby. Right, right, yeah. And it's been the same with every cycle in every economy. They're, That's they're, crazy. E- even right now, look, look, look at the biggest dumpster fire in the world. There's parts of Europe that their economies are horribly run. But you mean are, California? The, and, and California. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. And New York. But, but you know what? There's still big winners in those places. You know? sure. And this is, this is what makes it that we continue to thrive through the cycles. And it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. By the way, I think too many people are managing their own money. It is so ing- – let me put it in perspective for you. I'm a former fund manager. I spent 12 years running a large cap growth fund. About 75% of my assets are managed by other people. Wow. I find the best of the best, specialists in everything from private credit to you know small cap, international, things like that. I want the best. Sure. Okay? I'm not the best at all this. So why on earth would I not pay a little tiny bit of money – to get the best for sure. And that's one of the things about our economy is that it doesn't cost you much anymore to get access to things because of the efficiencies that are being rendered, you know, um, you know, you got to you, you have to try to find a way to do that for yourself. I do you need- know what, do you know what the, one of the barriers though is I'm going to keep it real here. I'm scared to let Andrew look at all my crap. I don't want him to think I'm an idiot. Absolutely, it is. Well, that, that, like, no, it's that's true. so Number funny. I don't, I'm like, Brent, I, I like Brent. Yeah. The people close Andrew, to you. I'm like, yeah. but I don't like, I, I've been around Andrew enough to know how smart he is. Like, I totally want help from Andrew, but I'm yep. like, oh, he's going to think I'm an idiot. You are in very good company. You know what I, I mean? All the time. And people are just, it, I think that's kind of scary for them. But people you know what? Hold it, their finances closer than anything else. They'd rather talk about their sex life than their financial. Wait, than, oh, than their yeah. but what if they don't? Wait, they, not everybody has those. Don't say it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 No, but I mean, or the opposite true. is true. 
my stake president is my financial advisor. And no matter how awful he is, I can't fire him. Yep. So it's either your extreme totally. or the other extreme. And I see it all the time. Yep. See, that would be easier for me. But yeah, but yeah, I mean, that's what it's, I know people, I have more like connections than anybody, but I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, I'll pay more just so I can yell at them. Yeah. Not yell, but I mean like, dude, this sucks. Fix it. That's actually important. It is important. It, and, it, yeah. and it's hard because You don't want friends, your best friends being the guys that are servicing your, you want to be able totally. to like have a business relationship with somebody. It actually keeps things more honest also. I a hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. But in this case, like what, what I love about Andrew is- he doesn't do anything based off emotion, even in just normal life. Like he's just a logic he's black kind and of white person. Emotionless, anyways. But yeah, whatever. it's kind of a dark hole. That's a whole that, nother that black heart. But see, that's what I want. I want a cold, dark heart. That no, it's you want but, the Wolf of Wall Street managing your money. Right? Well, no, I don't want drugs involved. <laughs> that's for sure. I don't want quaaludes and so yeah. It, it's funny because I, I bet a lot of people think that too. Like I, well, we're all like that. I don't want to go play basketball with, you know the college guys because i'm gonna look like an idiot no one no one wants to feel dumb nobody wants to nobody does right and a lot of times when that happens that's what you feel but you know and what's interesting about our money is that for some reason we treat that differently though because i will go down and take my car to a specialist i'll have you know i have all these specialists in my life (laughs) right i don't do anything right i just do my job and i pick up the phone my wife thinks i'm a total wuss because i'm like if you know light bulb needs to change i call some guy i'm like hey who's the light bulb changer you know get him over to the house you know (laughs) jenna are you listening (laughs) this is where i get it from just so you know (laughs) (laughs) so i'm all about specialists right but some things you don't want to show the specialist like you don't want i mean that this is part of the yeah money's one of them yeah so two questions for you one is one of the most common things I hear, and I'd be curious to hear your thought on this. Everyone feels like the stock market is rigged. They feel like it's fake money, you know, and you hear these stories about Wall Street and they just go to confirm it, right? Or you hear how these guys stole money, Ponzi schemes. So everyone always goes, oh, I'm going to own real estate. It's a hard asset. I can feel it. I can touch it. If I own a share of Apple, it's fake. It's fake money. It's paper money. Like that's what it's a common thing. How would you respond I to that? You one stat that will destroy that. Because the stat's so powerful, okay? From 1960 through the end of 2019, okay? So that's 60 years-ish of history. The average, okay, so the S&P 500 is the 500 biggest companies in the United States. Those 500 companies over 60 years grew their earnings, the amount of money they were earning, by 6.5% every single year for 60 years that was the average the average stock price has gone up by six and a half percent every year for 60 years plus then you get the dividends which is about three percent that's how you get to this nine and a half or ten percent per year for stocks but the underlying stock without the dividends and the earnings have been almost exactly one to one for 60 years it's the polar opposite of the trading. The trading, it's insanity. If, in fact, the best thing that people can do for themselves, don't watch what the market's doing day to day. Turn it off. My piece of advice is lose your login. Yeah. That's what I tell them. Turn Kramer off. Turn the whole thing off, man. Because, <laughs> and by the way, I, used to, I got it. stories about Kramer. I was going to say, to Kramer I meant to ask another question. Maybe I'll sneak it in. I, I, I got some good Kramer. I used to cover his desk he, when really? he was a hedge fund manager before he was a TV guy. I was one of his traders on the floor. No way. That's a wild story. But um, you got, in the short term, animal spirits reign. There's no sanity. But in the long term, it's exactly the opposite. You are truly buying the future earnings of these companies. And it's, and it's important that people understand that. That is, that is why earnings are so important. So guys like me spend all of our time obsessing about everything that will affect earnings, interest rates, debt, employment, all those types of things. And that's important to know because a lot of times people will think and they'll look at the stock moving today on what's happening today, but it's not because of what's happening today. It's because everyone's got to project what's going to happen in the future and they're that's trying right. to price it. That's right. In what's happening. Well, today. like, okay, look at the market, how good the market's done since March 23rd. So the market for three straight weeks plummeted, like almost like a free fall, the fastest down 30% in history. Okay. Cratered. Now the market goes straight back up and everybody's calling me and they're like, why is the market going up? There's millions of people that have this thing and dying. And 
it wasn't as bad as we feared. Yep. Not even close. It wasn't as bad as we feared. We're well, normalizing. Going back to all these experts with yeah. these projections. Look and at it how wrong mean they it, were with COVID. Look how yeah. they're, they're wrong in everything. So why is it? Well, it doesn't mean that it's not bad. Yeah. It just wasn't as bad as we had feared at the yeah. beginning, right? Well, they got to sell their ads. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, people. There's an agenda, right? If you're a politician or you're in the media, you have an intense agenda to cause fear. Isn't that sad? Like, why can't we just pay somebody? Like, we should just crowdfund it. Like, hey, just, we should have your wife run it. <laughs> a network that just... Like there's no middle, no middle agenda, no, no advertising. You know, that like, used to be the nothing. news. Like it's yeah. right. <laughs> I mean, we were little kids. That was the news. It was super like, in fact, it was such a, well, a journalism scourge was like, to be biased. Journalism was like this virtuous oh, yeah. career. Now you pick sides and uh -huh. your station, you know, your station picks sides. Now. Yeah. I hate that oh, so me much. Too, man. I, and now that's the thing. Like I consider myself conservative. But I hate Fox every much as I hate oh, seeing it. Yeah, like, I, I hate them all. I hate them all. Me too. It's ridiculous. Like, the cash thing. Like, nothing we're hearing is right. And I mean, these numbers. I mean, now we're hearing that hospitals get more money if they have COVID patients. So, are COVID patients really COVID patients? Are, you know what I mean? So, all other forms of death went to zero. Right. Every, every death is a well, COVID. So, my grandma, quick story. I don't know if I told this on the last one, but she's been tested three times now. Positive the first one. Negative, no, negative the first one, positive the second one. The poor lady has been in full-blown lockdown. She's 93. No so symptoms. Five, no symptoms. Five times a day, the people that come in to give her medicine are in full, like, hazmat suits. And, she, you know, her memory's bad. So every time it happens, she's just, like, freaking out. Like, what is going on? And then the third one, negative. So, and now we hear there's only a 40%, like, you know. Only accuracy. About, accuracy. So it's like how many of these people that you say have COVID really actually have COVID, but if they get a positive, they're just going to oh, yeah. use it. And now it's just like, we're going to reopen, but everyone's going to take a month to, you know. How about that prison system back East where there was 3,300 inmates in the, in the County that tested positive 96% never had a single symptom. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I wonder how so much money they got. So here's what's crazy though. It's because I think this thing with Corona and COVID is, it's a good example to say, I feel like that's a lot of times why the short term investing doesn't work because people are trying to go off of these same data and projections in yeah. the short term and they're not based off anything. It's all guessing. And that is gambling. And that goes back to your earlier question. Why do people associate investing with trading Wall Street and gambling? And it's what you just said. And they're completely disconnected entirely. Yep. And so that's why when you invest, it's like you have to, it's got to be long-term. If it's short-term, it's not the right thing. Like and it has to be intentional. Yeah. And, and you know, we could have a whole nother podcast just on that subject, which is mostly what I spend time talking about. This is way more fun. You guys are like the <laughs> best podcast, of, you know. I think it's a good mix. Like we want to get in info out there. And I think it's so fascinating. Like you stepped out to go to the bathroom, but just talking to him about his, he's had this chart that he's made for 20 plus years of all the bad things that have happened. I use that chart. And how they just rebound. You still have it? Do you uh -huh. use it? Back to 1918. Uh -huh. It's got all the, yeah. It's fascinating. So what, what would you say? I mean, maybe this was it because of the quickest 30% drop, but mm -hmm. what, what would you say was the most detrimental to the economy over the last 20 years? Like, which one was kind of the worst? Well, hands down, it was the great financial crisis, right? 2008. That, yeah, 2008. Right. Until now, we'll see how this unpacks. I'm right. afraid this could end up being one of the one of the most insane self-inflicted economic injuries of all time. For like, sure. I mean, I can't. The number of people that have filed for unemployment in the past six weeks is like so sad to me. Well, the other 26 part, million Americans, you know. You're well, and a lot of them don't even want to come back to work because they're making more than they would have. Well, that's the thing. They're that's getting, a whole, don't even get me started. Like, that, that's, that, that's why they're filing. The jobs are telling them to file. you're going to make more money by filing unemployment yeah. than working. Yeah. But again, this is, this is pursuing European type thinking when it comes to lawmaking and it's bad you see the outputs their economy shrink they can't even grow right like it's very dangerous i i know it feels relaxing to us because it makes everybody less stressful the government will print money and give us money right. but what it ultimately does is it makes it takes motivation out of the system for people and it really hurts your economy this is going to be I'm, I'm not as worried about like 
in the in the financial crisis, we were worried about a collapse. Right. What I'm worried about now is the next several years of of getting back to growth. Right. And what does that look like? This is really tricky. You know, man, <clears throat> it is tricky. It, like just human behavior. It's I don't know why we have gone to that whole like, well, it's government wanting more power, in my opinion. It's just like if the more they have to rely on us the more relevant well, we are. I think are, there's, a right? na- there's, a, there's an insidious triangle that we don't intentionally have. Well, you know, one is, yeah, the government wants their reliance on them, right? right. They, they're the winners. The more we need our politicians, right? The more for safety, sure. it, right? That's how you get Nancy Pelosi or whoever in for 50 years right. in, in their seat. But then the media is an accomplice because their ratings right now are sky high. Right. Nobody was watching local news. Now it's exploded again, right? Okay, so there's a, we're, they're complicit. And the truth is we are also complicit. For because sure. just naturally we want to be lazy. So if the government says, hey, I'm going to put X amount of money in your bank account a month. I'm going to take care of this. We go, oh yeah, that's great. I like that, right? And we don't really think twice about it. It's just like, here you go. Let's turn on the printing machine. And so That's wild. So a lot of people are worried about like, what is all of this money going to do to the economy? Are you worried about that? Are you Not worried in the about short term. that? You know, it was a big worry after the financial crisis. I remember for two or three years, we just argued constantly about inflation was coming because we printed so many dollars. The thing that's important to remember is inflation has two components. The creation of the money. Okay, so we print a ton. So it's called M2. It's like money supply. There's that many more dollars out in the system, right? The second part that no one ever wants to talk about is the, the money has to have velocity. In other words, it has to be being used aggressively. And the more aggressive money is being used, the more danger your economy is in of either overheating or collapsing. So what happened was going into 08, my neighbor who made $45,000 a year had his fifth spec house on a flip. Yeah. Okay. That's aggressive money, right? It's being lent freely into the system. It's just being given away to people, right? And the banks just, all they wanted you to do was borrow because they made money if you borrow, yep. right? Okay. Until we get back to aggressive money, inflation is no worry. And we're not there. Whoa. Well, we, I'd no, say you right know, now it's probably sl- it's the opposite. Because people yeah. are yeah. getting the money and holding on to it. No one's spending money. Right? Well, banks, have, because of 2009, I mean, to qualify for loans is still yep. difficult. Oh it's st- you're right. It still is. You know. And by the way, we represent 2,500 high net worth families out of the firm, you know, and I mean, high net worth. They are sitting on record levels of cash and they were before this, not not because of yeah, COVID. They haven't moved Coming cash. into COVID, yeah. they were. Because no one's sure if they can trust the system and, you know, the market's gone up a lot and I'm worried. And so actually we, we're pretty conservative as a country right now in our personal so 08 maybe sheets, helped you know? us a little bit. Oh, it absolutely COVID did. could have been a lot worse. I'll give you another thing that's positive. Okay. We, 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 it's easy to talk about the negative things. If, if you drew a line over the last 30 years and said, I want you to pick a month, we should launch a COVID virus. You might have picked last month. And here's why. Interest rates are at an all-time low. Literally a 5,000-year low, okay, globally. So all the money we're using to try to save ourselves is free, right? Secondly, employment was the best it had been in 50 years. The bank balance sheets in the United States were the best they'd been in 30 years. And the personal savings rate was four times higher by household than in 07 going into the financial crisis. Okay, so there was a lot. We we actually came into this at a really good time to come into this, and it's going to allow us to get out of it in a lot better way. What I'm more worried about, the question really becomes when we get to the other side of this later and the economy starts to turn back up, do our politicians have the discipline to say no later? Okay, so we can say yes now. And we said yes in the financial crisis, but in the 12 years since the financial crisis, no politician wants to change anything, man. Nobody wants to look at entitlement spending. Nobody wants to look at any of these programs. There's not a politician that has the nerve to say no. And that's my bigger concern, actually, than the printing of the money is what do you do later to restore some fiscal discipline in the, in the government. I don't think we're ever going to see it. I think you will never see fiscal discipline again as long as that's what buys votes. As long as there's Republicans and Democrats, it will never exist. Yeah, it's an arms race because now even the Republicans have sort of given up their their fiscal responsibility mantra. They they just want to print true. too. You know, no one. You know, I mean, the Tea Party has their little niche 
uh, in the political stratosphere, but not much. But the problem is it's in one tiny little area and they're just so zealous in that one area. I know. You know, it's like the truth is always found in the middle. That's right. You know, like it always has been, it always will be. I wonder if you'll start seeing a migration again to the state, you know, like a Utah that is a little more fiscally responsible to yeah. where it's just safer to be here. Hey, I Utah mean, is a great place to be. Everything we're seeing place. right now, the data, what a great place to live. Yeah. You know? Right. And I mean, yeah. Our government's done a really good job. They've done awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, but hopefully we don't get too crowded and stay away. Actually, it really sucks here. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't come. Yeah, You're right. It exactly. sucks here. Especially the inversion. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, California is sending military yeah. <laughs> choppers after surfers. Oh, man. Those don't cost Kurt, we grand. could go on for so much more time. But no, thanks, seriously, this is like the funnest so like, interview I've So much fun. Had. We got to do right. another one of these. We'll do. We'll, we'll come out of COVID. Because I want to talk to him about the licensing thing that you and I that Oh, there's a I lot. I get him going on a rant with, <laughs> you know, because he wants to help share information with people, you know, like Jim Cramer. But you can't be licensed without, I mean, what, getting sued? Right, mm -hmm. you can't tell people what to invest in unless you're not licensed. You have to be really careful with this stuff. You know, it's the crazy. government's really worked its way into it, and in some of it's good because right. there are so many fraudsters sure. that you have to protect people. And then the downside of it is it gets extreme and ridiculous, and you actually right. are getting in people's way now of well, getting right. good information. The fact that he can't, yeah, get on and help people. There's guys making a hundred grand a month on YouTube, and they don't even have a license. Right, no license. Yeah. That's crazy. Anyways, that'd be fun to talk about. But no, thanks for coming. This thanks, was, Kurt. Oh, this is great. Crap. You're thanks a great bishop. This is fun. Keep it up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs>